people really get caught up in this follow your passion thing. But at the end of the day, we all have to pay the rent. We all have to eat. So if your passion is not going to put off enough income to make this idea sustainable, you're probably going in the wrong direction. If I looked at my passion, my passion is cooking. Every time I've invested in any restaurant related activity, I've lost money. So if I would have followed that passion, I would probably be living on the street. What, what are three of the biggest lessons that you would teach an entrepreneur? Now. Number one is, the second one is, the other thing is. My name's Rudy Moore, host of Living the Red Life podcast, and I'm here to change the way you see your life. In your earpiece every single week. If you're ready to start living the red life, ditch the blue pill, take the red pill, join me in Wonderland and change your life. Guys, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Living the Red Life. Today, we've got Larry joining us from Entertainment Television. You've probably heard about it. You've probably watched The Kardashians and many of the other shows that he's helped produce and bring to life. Um, you know, if you don't know E! News or Entertainment Television, they are valued around $5 billion. He actually sold to Comcast. Um, they are accessible in over 140 countries. And today we're going to dive into how he built one of the biggest entertainment giants on the planet from zero. Larry, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. And I'm so excited. I know you've had an amazing entrepreneurial career and, and obviously given some of the biggest celebrities and brands a platform. Um, so yeah, let, let's dive in. If someone doesn't know who you are and they don't know, you know, E! Entertainment. Um, I know you've obviously sold now, but can you uh, maybe give a little bit, a 60 second story about um, what it does and how it became so successful? Sure, it, you know, my my partner, Alan Marufka and I, you know, two, two ordinary guys came up with this idea of doing, you know, uh, Entertainment Tonight, 24 hours a day or MTV of the movies. and as we called it, and we weren't smart enough to know that people don't start TV networks. So we just wrote a business plan and we went out. And uh, uh, I think even today, uh, it's the only TV network that's ever been started just by people, um, as opposed to big media companies, you know, and going out looking for money, people going, nice idea, but you're not Time Warner and you're not Comcast. And you know, you can't do that. People don't start TV networks. And I guess Alan and I weren't smart enough to realize that uh, you're not supposed to be able to do it. So we just kept going until we finally did it. Well, sometimes I say in entrepreneurship, that blind optimism can actually benefit you because you don't overanalyze or, or limit yourself, right? And that sounds like uh, what happened with you guys. Yeah. And, you know, it's a great example of, you know, being necessity, you know, really pushing your creativity to limit. When when we started, the going rate for starting a TV network was somewhere around $100 million and um, kind of the low end, maybe $60 million. But we found a, a place on Wall Street that said, we love this, but we only could sign for two and a half. And, you know, we were like, well, what do we do with two and a half million? Um, but then we realized nobody's given us the 60 or 100. And we said, you know what, we'll give us the two and a half, we'll figure it out. And uh, it really did push us to um, to really be very innovative and think of stuff. We, we didn't buy real broadcast equipment. We bought used equipment from like some companies that were using it for training videos. And um, I had a friend that was teaching radio, television, film in Austin, Texas, UT. And um, we called him up and said, you know, Brian, do you have any kids that need intern jobs? And he did. He sent us 31 interns. And so he actually started with 11 employees and 31 interns. Wow. And, um, you know, just some of the shows that really broke through. Originally, we were showing movie trailers and, you know, had a host in front of a green screen MTV style. But, uh, um, you know, the first show that broke through was Talk Soup. And, uh, you know, when we came up with that, you know, uh, even our own crew was going, wait a second, you want to do a TV show that makes fun of TV shows? And I was like, yeah, exactly. And, you know, we were getting clips from the best shows on television for free. Um, and even though we were poking fun gently, um, you know, for them, it was a great promotion and it was free and they loved it and they got behind it and stuff like that. 
And then we used, what we did there was instead of selling the inventory to advertisers, we used the ad inventory to promote the other shows on the network so that people would tune in to see that crazy show, but then we would promote what else was on the network. Yeah, it's kind of smart because you're using already really strong brands, right? Or shows, and then you're pulling them into yours and, and leveraging all their audiences. Yeah, and you know, and originally we started just with movie trailers. And you know, when I called the studios and said, hey, the only time I ever see a movie trailer is when I'm in the movies, and that's probably the best two minutes of a movie. Don't you want me to see that in homes that make me want to go to the movie? And I said, well, we can't afford it. And I said, you know what? Send us those things and we'll put them on TV. So if you think about early MTV, when they actually showed music videos, they stood a host in front of a green screen and they would point to it and say, and Madonna has a new video. And we said, we could stand the host in front of a green screen and go, hey, and Schwarzenegger has a new movie. So we started with all this incredibly high quality, high level content um, there. And then we did Talk Soup and then Howard Stern, you know. So once we developed the, the audience base and the revenue stream, uh, you know, the rest kind of followed. We started doing new shows and, you know, E! Hollywood True Story and Wild on E! And, you know, it kind of went on from there. But, but this is, you know, why I was so excited for this episode because, you know, it's become a massive success now. I mean, it's about, you know, uh, valued over 5 billion in, in 100 plus countries. And, and you obviously sold to Comcast. But like this all started with a, a big idea, people telling you it can't be done, figure it out, raise a little bit of money, but like, you know, maybe what, like 5% of what you maybe needed or less. And then like, how do yeah. we make and that is entrepreneurship at its core, in my opinion. Yeah, well, thanks. You know, we, we um, uh, you know, like I say, we were forced into the position of figuring out how to maximize the value of every penny. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing we did, which, turn, you know, turned out to be really smart, people say to me, they go, oh, you were so lucky you had all those great hosts. You know, and we had Greg Kinnear and Julie Moran went on to do Wide World of Sports and um, you know, so on and so forth. And then, you know, the later days, Brooke Burke, Ryan Seacrest. And so there are a lot of good people that came off of that network, but it wasn't an accident. You know, Alan and I realized that we're not going to dazzle anybody with fancy production. And we said, we're going to really spend our money to find the best host we can, love them or hate them. We mm -hmm. wanted you to feel something about them. And um, we, we ended up putting over 7,000 people on tape in order to get those first five hosts. So wow. that was not an accident. That was the smartest thing we did. And uh, again, that's like, you know, you, you kind of had that vision, right? I mean, a lot of the time entrepreneurs often get caught up because they don't, they don't know where to invest the money or they don't have that clear plan. But, you know, it sounds like you had that clear plan that VC is, Hey, we're, you know, we can't maybe compete on production level, but we can compete on hosts if we really dedicate our time, energy, effort and money there. And and obviously it paid off, right? And and if someone's listening, what, what are some of the other shows? I know we spoke about, you know, a famous uh, one, but what are some of the other shows that came out of all of this? Well, you know, Top Soup ran 20 something years and then Howard Stern obviously did well and then Wild on E and E Hollywood True Story and, uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, Ryan Seacrest, e, e! News has been a staple of television around the world for many years now. And, you know, then, of course, the probably the one that um, everybody knows is the Kardashians. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, you know, a, a global success, not just in terms of audience, but look at what it's done to elevate the Kardashians into becoming a global brand. Yeah. I, do you ever look back and look at all the success of these shows and what you feel and like, remember those early days? What What would you tell yourself now, knowing where you got to now with it all? Well, it, it, it's actually kind of funny. E, e obviously was financially, you know, the the best one, but I, I've been doing a lot of stuff in Asia um, in, in the post E years. And uh, I decided at this late date, I'm actually kind of funny and I'm going to write comedy. Um, so I wrote a, I wrote a sitcom 
uh, about the contradictions of modern Chinese life, and we made it in China. Um, strangely enough, it went 72 episodes before I decided I can't be funny beyond 72. But the interesting part about it was it was actually nominated in the Asia TV Awards in the best sitcom category, and it was the only sitcom from China that was nominated. So wow. when I look back at the stuff I've done, I go, okay, I figured out that people around the world love Hollywood gossip. Uh, you know, that was pretty, but to write a comedy in a country that you didn't grow up in, in a language you don't speak, I go, that was actually kind of pretty cool. So, yeah. you know, a, a lot of people are surprised when I say that, but you know, that writing comedy in China really is the highlight of, you know, my stuff. I love that. Uh, and what would you say, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, people listening, um, you know, this company got built, obviously it's valued at billions now. And, um, you know, you started with this big, crazy idea, right? And determination. What would you say to anyone listening that wants to build a big company and, and just like you, maybe they, you know, get told it's not possible, you can't do it, it costs a hundred million, like, what would you say to the entrepreneur listening? Well, I think, you know, for me personally, I think, you know, the greatest, you know, thing that I do is I wake up every morning with 10 new ideas. By the yeah. time I go to sleep, I realize most of them were pretty dopey. Is everybody, you know, I find people really get caught up in this follow your passion thing. Well, you know, follow your passion is kind of interesting, but at the end of the day, we all have to pay the rent. We all have to eat. So if your passion is not going to put off enough income to make this idea sustainable, you're probably going in the wrong direction. So uh, I, I have this thing. I put my ego aside. Every night I self-assess all the things that I'm doing or thinking of doing. And like I say, a lot of times I just go, what was I thinking this morning? That's pretty dopey. We all have the same amount of time. I don't care who you are. You could be a zillionaire. You could be poor on the street. Time is something that we all have in common. So how do you maximize your time? And a lot of people just, their ego makes them stick with ideas that for whatever reason, it could have been a good idea yesterday, but the environment has changed. The technology has changed. Is to be able to look at stuff literally every day and going, is this still viable or is it just my ego telling me to keep going and put your time where you can maximize it. And again, if it's not going to be revenue generating and it's not going to let you eat and pay the rent and feed the kids and do all of that stuff, it's not going to last long because the realities of life will take over. Yeah, I like that. I think, um, you know, I, I always say to people, you've got to, you've got to build something that is smart and it can be profitable and scalable and has good ideas. And I think if you can, you know, if, if it's something that you wake up excited for every day and it's something that, um, you know, you're truly passionate about, that's a bonus, but in business, there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be times where you're loving life and winning. And then there's going to be times where you're like, you know, in, in, in a black hole and, and trying to fight your way out of it. Right. And, and I'm sure you've had some times and stories of that in your career too. Oh God. Yeah. You know, and, uh, uh you know, for me, uh, I mean, obviously TV is, I do pretty good at, you know, I've created shows literally all around the world, but, um, you know, if I looked at my passion, my passion is cooking yep. and, Every time I've invested in any restaurant related activity, I've lost money. Um, you know, so if I would have followed that passion, I would probably be living on the street. Um, uh, but I, I do it for myself. And for me, it's instead of going into therapy, I go in the kitchen and cook and I takes all the stress out of my life and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think it's a good example of, you know, sometimes your passion needs to be part of your life, but it shouldn't dominate your business life. For sure. And I want to ask you, you know, we talked about the Kardashians a little offline and, you know, that was obviously a big, um, you know, success. What were some of, obviously, you you, you saw behind the scenes and, and obviously are close with the family. What are some of the, the, the um, things you saw there that kind of, made them so successful because obviously you gave them a bit of a platform but they were already like we said you know they have the brains behind it too um i'd love to talk about that for a minute 
Sure. I mean, you know, they, they come from an interesting family to begin with. You know, you had, uh, you know, Chris was married to Bob Kardashian, who was the lawyer for O.J. Simpson, you know, for many years. And that was always in, in the press. And the girls kind of grew up in front of the camera. Um, you know, but then Chris um, uh, ended up with, with Bruce before Bruce became Caitlyn. And uh, they just, they were doing infomercials. They were, they were always in, in, in the public eye. And, you know, quite honestly, I think he certainly, we gave them the platform uh, to show off. But I, I've always said, and I still to this day, the, the really, the, the person who formulated the strategy for elevating them into a global multi-billion dollar brand is the mom, it's Chris. Um, you know, Chris just groomed those girls. And, you know, when uh, they learned how to act in front of the camera from a really, really young age and stuff. And, you know, a lot of what you see, people forget that it's television. So it's overly dramatized. So don't think that they're exactly what you've seen on the show. A lot of it was performing for the camera um, and stuff. But you look at the girls. I mean, they've been amazing business people. Um, I think the mom kind of laid the foundation and the girls have picked up and learned from it and they're on their own. And then you look at things like what Kim is doing for, you know, prison reform and stuff like that. So it's a great example of how they, they made their fortune and now have turned to trying to do good um, yeah. there. And I don't, I don't think they get enough credit for the good that they try and do and, or good that they do do. <laughs> well, you know, probably better than anyone. Uh, I mean, entertainment and Hollywood, they love to, uh, you know, push your flaws more than your, your wins and the good you do, right? That's saddle reality a little. Yeah, you know, the, the whole thing, you know, people think of reality shows being real. They, they're the furthest thing from real. You know, I mean, I crack up when, you know, people say, oh my God, did you watch Survivor last night? I wonder if Joe's going to fall off the cliff. And I go, no, the 200 people from the, the production crew are going to make sure he doesn't fall off the cliff. Um, you know, you forget that there's, uh, this is a TV show. And, there's always someone on a reality show. I call him the person with the pin, you know, and that's, you know, when things kind of get a little bit slow, somebody comes in and sticks someone in the butt with the pin and go, do you know what they said about you? You're going to let them get away with that? You know, so you have to have drama. That's why people came to the show. And if the drama is not natural, you know, the show has the, uh, the way of, in, you know, getting it going. Yeah, I just I shot my first TV show last year as this summer, and uh, I just shot a second show where it was kind of my show, and I fully produced and directed it. Um, and uh, I was the guy with a pin quite a few times, you know. To you know, I mean, real life is more like this, whereas in TV it has to be like yeah. zero to a hundred, right? Yeah, you, you you gotta have a certain amount of drama within the show, or the audience goes somewhere else. And you know, I mean that. That's why they came there, and um, you know, and and again, it's it's a TV show. People have to realize that you know this has been condensed, and you may have forty hours of footage that you've condensed into a half hour TV show, and it, you're showing the audience only what you want them to see. Yeah, yeah, and that, but that is the the art of storytelling, right? And creating content, which we now do on social media, on TikTok, on YouTube. But you know that psychology of how we like to consume content is is generally the same our attention spans might be shorter than ever but at our core as humans i think we like to be entertained educated motivated inspired um so yeah and obviously you did a good job on those yeah it's all the same and, it, and it's that way on a global scale i mean people say how do you manage that I, i've had a hit tv show in russia for 10 years i've been developing shows and doing them in China and stuff. And it's essentially people are 80% 80, 80 are the same and 20% is cultural, geographical, where you grew up with. Um, and we all have those common things. We, we go to work, we work our butt off and we come home and we want to be entertained and educated or, you know, and it changes at times. I mean, it's not, people go, television is dead. And I go, no, it's not. Sometimes I watch it on my, my, my telephone and sometimes I watch it on the big screen. It's story, it all boils down to it's storytelling. And sometimes I want it on the big screen, sometimes I want it on the small, sometimes I want it in, 
in two minute bites. Sometimes I want it in one hour so I could just lump out on the couch. It's all of those things. It's not one of those things. Yeah, I love that. So, you know, obviously building this business for many years, it's been very successful. But what what are three of the biggest lessons that you would teach an entrepreneur? Like I always like to ask from someone that's been in it and kind of came out and exited and built a successful company. Three lessons you would love to teach the audience listening today. Well, I mean, so some of the stuff, I mean, no, number one is this, don't get caught up in the follow your passion thing. Um, yeah. Really be honest with yourself and self-assess everything you're doing to make sure you're maximizing the value of your time um, in, in every way possible. Uh, you know, the, the second one is always hire, look at the different components of what your, your, your task is going to be and hire people that actually can perform those things better than you can. I yep. mean, I'm really good at managing people, but if you were to tell me, uh, go edit this, I could hire editors that are so much better than I am, but I know how to manage those editors. So always hire smarter. And, um, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, just really um, pay attention to the environment. Um, you know, the business climate changes, the technology changes. Now everybody, it cracks me up, you know, uh, fighting uh, artificial intelligence going, oh my God, we get, it's going to take our jobs. It's going to put, it, it could be one of the greatest tools you've ever used if you learn how to use it. And, you know, people say, what would be a good, um, a, you know, a job for the future? I said, learn how to prompt. I yeah. mean, people who know how to prompt AI, programs are going to be invaluable because you could do stuff. I, I mean, in my example, if, if you were to come to me and say, could you design a TV series about XYZ? Normally it takes me five days to kind of lay it out and develop it and whatever. Now, you know, I've been using GBT from when GBT was just starting and uh, GBT4. It now takes me 30 seconds Crazy, right? You get it. I spend about an hour cleaning it up because it never comes out right. It comes out 80%. So now in one hour, I'm getting done what used to take me five days. So I can either do more of those and make more money. I could spend time with my little grandbaby. I could learn how to speak Spanish or I could learn how to cook Portuguese. I could reclaim time. Again, time is finite. We all have, you know, we all have to deal with that reality. I don't care who you are or how rich you are or how poor you are. It's we all have time and time is measured by, you know, some supreme being who decides how long we're going to be here. Yeah, I love that. We, uh, we've we had about 80,000 entrepreneurs through our, we have an AI um, event online where we teach entrepreneurs this and, you know, we, it's changed how we run our business and, even when I was filming my show uh, a couple of months ago, one of the challenges, it kind of messed up and we weren't able to get it, you know, all the props and stuff in time. And we literally went on there and in 10 minutes, we had a new challenge idea that was able to pull off within 24 hours, right? It's just crazy. And, yeah. you know, they, the 80% thing's fascinating because a lot of people complain about that to me. And I'm like, you know, I've hired thousands of employees. I have about a hundred employees now. And I go, that's just the same level an employee would get it, but I don't have to wait a week and pay them a bunch of money, you know? So. Yeah, no, it's, um, it, it, I think, you know, the thing with AI, it could be dangerous. We we don't have our, our regulators, lawmakers, politicians haven't really begun to understand it yet. So there's nothing that governs this thing. I mean, in the example I use, if a 12 year old kid decides they want to drive a car, they can't just get in the car and drive. You got to be a certain age. You got to take driver's education. You got to take a driving test. And then you have to obey the rules of the road. I think with AI, it's the same thing. I mean, there needs to be something that says people who have bad intentions know there are consequences for getting caught ex exercising bad intentions. But, you know, you go back and you look at, you know, cavemen used to paint on the wall of a cave, you know, with like blood. And they weren't real happy when somebody invented canvas and paint. Um, you know, horse horse ranchers weren't thrilled when somebody invented cars. Um, yeah. 
technology marches on whether you like it or not. I think the music business probably learned that lesson. <clears throat> they fought digital music for 10 years and you, you wouldn't have had iTunes and Spotify and, you know, you wouldn't have had these, these strong monsters that, you know, now the music industry is trying to figure out how you lessen their leverage and, you know, <clears throat> and until Taylor Swift came along, they, nobody figured it out. But, um, you know, you, you've really got to realize that if technology can do good, there will be people who figure out how to harness it for good. And if it can do bad, there will be people who figure out how to harness it for bad. Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, we're, we're wrapping up today. I appreciate all the lessons. It's been awesome to dive into your career and, and you know, obviously building this massive um, entertainment empire that m many of us have known and consumed and all your lessons doing that. Uh, last question I always ask everyone, um, what are you up to now and where can people learn more about you? Sure, um, you could go to LJN at um, ljnmedia.com and find out more about what we're up to or my company in China is called Meitan Global, M-E-T-A-N global.com. Um, with COVID, I started doing stuff in the U.S. again and doing, um, uh, I, we just created a series, Financial Wellness for Millennials. Uh, we just did another series called Conscious Parenting about the difficulties of being a parent in today's complex world. Um, we're working on finishing up the development of a series called Uncanceled, all about cancel culture, which I, you know. Uh, I don't care what side of the fence you're on, you can't. Uh, I saw something today where Disney decided Tinkerbell was not politically correct to be a greeter at Disneyland and because her body image is, I'm like, this has just gone way over the top. So yeah. we're doing something to create a platform for people who have been canceled right or wrong to at least get their side of the story out there or apologize for, you know, sometimes they say, hey, that was dumb. I shouldn't have done it. And apologize. And then the other thing I'm doing, there's um, uh, found a woman out of the UK named Natasha Graziano, who six years ago was a homeless mom in London. Uh, today, she's a life coach to Will I Am and Steve Aoki and folks yeah. like that. And she's uh, living in Bel Air. And uh, we're, so we developed a nighttime talk show around her. Because interestingly enough, there are no women in late night television in the US. Um, with, and she's less of, you know, so Tom Cruise, tell me about your next movie and more about, she'll interview like King Batch, who, you know, was a big Vine star at, you know, one time and, you know, really get into like, what, what are your feelings about life and emotions and relationships and things like that? So she's very motivational, inspirational, as opposed to promoting your next media project kind of thing. Yeah, she's a good friend of mine too. She's, um supposed to be on the podcast as well soon so small well <laughs> yeah no she's uh she's different you know we did a i shot a pilot with her and um you know it's interesting because she is totally different we shot it in a nightclub on la cienega um yep. as opposed to shoot it in a tv studio and um and you know we, we actually use john lugazamo's production company so, you know, we have a woman host and an all Latino production crew. And, uh, you know, and it, it's a it's a very different take on late night television. It's a throwback to an old show that uh, you have to used to do called Playboy After Dark, where you felt you were kind of a fly on the wall looking in on his living room on a Friday night and his friends would just drop in. Um, and that's kind of the feel of the show. It's it's somewhere between Playboy After Dark and, and Graham Norton, uh, you know, out of the UK. It's it's not your traditional host behind a desk talking to a guest sitting in a chair next to him kind of thing. Love it. Cool. Well, Larry, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. And it's been an amazing uh, time here. And I, I know everyone uh, probably had an amazing, amazing experience. Uh, learning obviously such a massive company that you feel and uh guys that's a wrap until next time keep living the red light take care